Prodigal is about the prodigal, not son. Prodigal father. You see, we mess this thing up. We, uh, we read the Bible, but we don't read it because we've read other books that tell us about having read it, and it messes things up. 1200s, they put verses and chapters into it that messes things up. And I will suggest to you that when you read the Word of God, read the Word of God. Don't read into it. Before you read another book, read the book that really counts. And then after you read the book that really counts, read other books about the book. And that's cool. But read the Bible. Please read the Bible. And when you read the Bible, find out where the text is that you're playing with and back up until you find the context. Because if you take a text out of context, you make it a pretext for anything you want to do. And so in this particular message this morning, I saw my daddy running. It's a, the story of a prodigal and how he perceives his dad. We'll get there in a minute. But in this message, it, it's about lost things, but not lost. There's nothing lost in these stories. They've been misplaced. They need to be found and recovered. It starts in chapter 13. There's religious people and their sinners in the congregation around Jesus. He's been in church that morning, and when he came out of church, he was met by those in and those out because they weren't good enough to get in. You know what I'm saying? And so the sinners outside and the sinners inside, they meet and they clash when Jesus comes out. And so as these inside are looking down like buzzards on those outside, Jesus begins to speak to them in parables so that everybody understands what the message is all about. The message is real simple. We all sinners, amen? Hey, they sinners in here right now, right? You, you know Jesus? Is your name written in the Lamb's Book of Life? You know Jesus? If you die right now, you know that you know that you know you're going to die and go to heaven, right? You sin? Of course you do. And so there's sinners inside and sinners outside, but sometimes we get all prickly and prudish and self-righteous, and we think we're somebody like we got a, like a corner on the market of Jesus, and we look down on others that don't seem to have a grip on it like we do. And Jesus says, every one of us needs a little bit of growth. Every one of us needs a little bit of maturity. Every one of us needs a little bit more than we think we've got. And so in this story, he begins to talk about things that have been lost. It ain't about the sheep. It ain't about the coin. It ain't about the son. It's about the shepherd. It's about the woman in the house. And it's about the father. And so the sheep were just being the sheep. Sheep got lost. Shepherd understood the law. Shepherd understood the need. Shepherd walks out and does a count. Shepherd says, I got 99, I'm missing one. And he went and he found the lost sheep. And when he realized the lost, and he went and found, recovered, and reclaimed the lost sheep, he came back and says, let's party. Because that which has been misplaced, that which has been lost, has been found. <coughs> Hallelujah. And so the woman that had the coin lost the coin. The woman said, oh my goodness, I'm going to lost my coin. And I don't know about y'all, but when I lose money, I'm going to find my lost money. Amen? I don't have enough money to go around, and so I can't afford to lose any man that I've got. Amen? Amen. Well, so she realized she lost the coin. And when she realized she lost the coin, the coin doesn't know she's lost. She does. And she said, I, I lost the coin. i got to find that coin. She turns the house upside down. Why? Because she understands the loss. Why? Because it's valuable. Why? Because she needs it. Why? Because she needs it. And so she found the coin. She said, Hallelujah! Found me a coin. Found my lost coin. You know what she did? She invested the lost coin at a party. Hallelujah. And then you get to the, the message for the morning. Now, may I share? Since I know that some of y'all, maybe not all of y'all, maybe not any of y'all, think that I only work four hours a week. I have a Sunday morning message, Sunday school, second service, and Wednesday. So uh, all I do, I only work four hours a week. And since I only work four hours a week, I figured that I needed to do something with my time this week. And so I got the Crane's translation of a prodigal phone. And it took hours and hours and hours and hours of study and prayer to be able to give you the Hebrew translation of the Greek translation of these scriptures, allow me to share with you the prodigal son, N. F. Minor. Feeling footloose and frisky, a feather-brained fellow forced his fond father 
the four go over the farthings, and flew far to foreign fields and frittered away his fortune. Feasting fabulously with faithless friends, fleeced by his fellows in folly, and facing famine, he found himself in a filthy farmyard, fairly famishing that he fain would have filled his frame with foraged food from fodder brackets. Fill it! My father's flunk is fair far fine. The frazzled fugitive frankly faced facts. Feeling frustrated by failure and filled with foreboding, he fled forthwith to his family. Falling at his father's feet, he forlornly fumbled. Father, I flunk. I fruitlessly forfeited family favor. The far-sighted father, forestalling future flinching, frantically flagged the flunkies to fetch a family, a family for the flock and fix a feast. The far and fix a feast. The fugitive's fault-finding brother frowned on fickle forgiveness of former father all, but the faithful father figured. Filial fidelity is fine, but the fugitive is thin. What forbids fervent festivity? Let flags be unfurled and fanfares flare. So father's forgiveness formed the foundation for the former fugitive's future fortitude. Amen. Amen. Did you get all of that? Yeah. Let me translate. <laughs> there was a guy that owned a lot of land and he had two sons. The younger son said, Father, give me what's mine and the father done it. Didn't have to, but he did it anyhow. And when the son got his part of the inheritance, he ran to a foreign land and he flittered away his fortune with, with foolish friends. He wasted his money, he wasted all that he had on things that didn't matter, and he found himself without friends and without money. And so that he wouldn't starve, he went and found someone so he could feed the pigs. And in the middle of the pig pen, he came to his senses, and he realized, my father's servants fare much better than I do, and I'll go to my father's house, and I will say to my father, Father, I am not worthy of being your son. I ask and I, I beg of you, just make me one of the hired hands, and I'll be good with that. Now the message for the morning. It's found in Luke 15, around verse 20. The father seeing his son a great distance off, ran to him, threw his arms around him, hugged him, loved on him, and began to cry out to his servants, My son that was misplaced, my son that has been lost, has now come home. Let us have ourselves one bodacious party. Amen. Amen? Amen. All right. I saw my daddy run. The son had never seen his daddy run. Never. It was undignified for anybody to run. May I share with you why? They wore skirts, not breeches. And if you had to run, you had to reach down there and grab your skirts above your knees. And it was unlawful. It was against the law to show your legs in public. Nobody done that. And so for a warrior on the battlefield, that's one thing. But for a, an old guy, an elder, a, a guy that was rich and affluent, that was unbecoming for somebody to do that. And so the daddy rolled up his skirts, stuck it in his belt loop, and took off running for his young. Amen? And so here we are. I can say before you this morning, I've seen my daddy run three times in my life. I saw my daddy run. Daddy was about as short as five foot four, as about as wide as he was tall. Strong as could be, but he would say, boy, ain't made for running. Ain't made for running. Well, ain't made for not. But I saw my daddy run three times in my life. The first time I was out, and, and, and Daddy was a picker before there was such things, and Daddy had found the hood of a 54 or 55 truck, kind of made like a boat. Remember those? And made like a boat. He made me a seesaw. He put weights on one end, and he put a seat on the other end, and I could get on that and rock that thing off and just have myself a time. 
Well, I rocked it too hard, and when I rocked it too hard, it came over. When it came over, I stood up. When I stood up, the weight caught me right here in front of my eye and I almost put my eye out. It cut me real bad. If you get close, you can see the scar, and it cut me real, real bad. And it fell on top of me. When I kicked it off, I started yelling. Because there's blood everywhere. And I started yelling, Daddy, Daddy, Daddy. When Daddy looked and saw that I'd cut myself, I saw my daddy running. Daddy ran over there and Daddy picked me up. And in those days, the doctor's office was about a block from the parsonage. Daddy picked me up and he ran all the way down to the doctor's office, broke into the doctor's office, started yelling for the doctor. The doctor came around, saw blood everywhere, grabbed me, went back in the back, and he sewed me back up better than any plastic surgeon ever could. I saw my daddy run. Second time, I don't like horses and so they don't like me, but some fool had a great idea. We're going to take all these little youngins out there, we're going to put them on the back of dumb old horses, we're going to run them around the back car, we're going to have a great time. That's a stupid idea. <laughs> stupid idea. And so they put me on the back of an old mare, and that old mare wanted to go back to the house more than she wanted to be bothered by a bunch of screaming youngins. So as they're leaving with these reins, I'm on the back of that horse, that horse says, you know what, I about had enough of this, turned and started galloping back for the shed. Well, the lean-to was measured, the old horse would have to buckle them, had to duck down to get into the lean-to. It had a tin roof, and that tin roof would have caught me right about here. It would have killed me. There's no doubt it would have killed me. When that horse started galloping, I started yelling. When I started yelling, I saw my daddy run. As she was running back with the lean-to, I looked out of the corner of my eye, I saw my dad. And my dad saw what was going on, I saw my daddy run. There's two barbed wire fences between me and Ed, and Daddy cleared both of them. He outran that horse, and he got close to me, he jumped and grabbed that bridle. When he grabbed the bridle, he, slipped, he, he, he threw that horse around so that the horse skidded to his stomach. Threw me off, but he stopped that horse. It sprained my wrist and didn't kill me. Number three, we were youngins, and y'all yeah, you know what a falcon is, and no pop-up uh, uh, Sears Roebuck camper trailer, and that's what we had. We went to Smoky Mountains. And we was out there, and Daddy said, well, let's go to the bathhouse. So we were walking to the bathhouse, I'm up on Daddy's shoulders, and Daddy had no walking stick, and only God knows why he done it. There's a black bear that's got his butt up in the air as he's eating out of this garbage can, and Dad walked by and went, BAM! Hit that bear. That bear got mad. <laughs> And that bear started backing out of the garbage can. My, my daddy was not given the ugly words, but he said something. And he said, I don't think we can make it to the bathhouse, boys, and I'm going to try to have, we're going to try to run back to the tent. So he took off running. And she took off running, and I grabbed him by, the, by his neck, and he and I were both yelling, Bear! 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 And he was running for his life and mine, too. And I remember looking back, and it looked like that bear was gaining on both of us. As we got to the tent, Daddy reached up and grabbed me and threw me into a tree right beside the tent. When he threw me, he lost his balance and he tumbled. He came to his feet at the picnic table and jumped into a tree that was over the picnic table. Folks had heard us yelling about that bear down. It was hollering and screaming and scared that bear. I've seen my daddy run three times in my life. Right, now let's ask a question. Who's running? Daddy's running. Why is he running? His son means it to him. Amen. Daddy's running. Son needs him to be running. And what did Daddy do? Daddy came to the need of his son. Amen. That's your story. The prodigal son ain't the, 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 not the issue. He's not in a frame of mind to receive anything. It's the father, not the son. Well, the father, well, the son came to himself. You know why he went home? Because he knew he could. Hear me? He went home because he knew his daddy. He went home because he knew that his daddy was a good man. He knew that his daddy loved him. He knew that his daddy was forgiven. He knew that his daddy would accept him. He knew that his daddy would affirm him. He knew that his daddy would do the right thing. Knowing that, when he came to his senses, he didn't go away from his daddy. He came back to his daddy. Do you hear what I'm saying? So when I when I prepared to preach a message. I look at the text, before the text, within the text, and I ask myself, so what? 
What does it mean to me? Now let's look at it. Daddy saw his son a great distance off. And he ran. And he ran. And he hugged his son. And he loved his son. And he accepted his son. And he said to his son and to those around him, This, my son, who was lost, has been reclaimed. You go, let's have us a party. Now he put a robe on that boy. He put his ring on that boy. And they had a party. Everything that father did, he lost dignity in the eyes of everybody around him because nobody in their right mind, no father in their right mind would have done that. No father would. His father didn't hear me. His father didn't care about showing his legs. His father didn't care about being undignified. His father didn't care what anybody thought. His father didn't care what anybody said. All he knew was his boy that was lost has come home. And bless God, we want to have our sense of party. Can I tell you something? Can I tell you something? I don't care where you've been. And I don't care what you've done. God is looking, waiting for you to come home. And when you come home, kick it in the dirt if you want to, you ought to look up a little bit. Because when you look up, you won't see him scowling. You won't see him frowning. You won't see him cussing. You won't see him yelling. You won't see him red-faced. You won't see bands extended. You know what you will see? You'll see your Heavenly Father saying, Hallelujah, my boy's home. Hallelujah, my girl's home. He said, I don't know about y'all, but let me just, let's just play it out. Don't you think that boy was glad? Don't you? You know that boy was expected, right? What any of us would have, and many of us have been already experienced. He was expecting a tongue lashing. He was expecting condemnation and judgment. He was expecting his daddy to yell, fuss, cuss, kick, and all that kind of ugly stuff. But he still come home, hear him? He still come home. And though he expected it, he got what he didn't deserve. Don't we all? That's called grace. He got what he did deserve. That's called mercy. He got what he did deserve. That's called grace. Every one of us do every day we walk and breathe, don't we? And so here's the story. Who ran? The dad. Why did he run? He ran out of joy because his boy was all the way home. He ran out of mercy. Because he knew how that boy felt. He ran out of grace because he knew what that boy needed. He ran to show everybody around the house and everybody in the house. I got room enough to forgive. I got room enough to affirm. And I got room enough to bring my boy back. I don't want my boy to be less than my boy is. You hear what I'm saying? You hear me well. God don't want you to be less than you are. And what we do is we shortchange ourselves because of guilt and grief. We say, God can't love me, and we say it because we don't love ourselves, don't we? God can't love of this, God can't love of that. If a father could go run down the road and get in the pit manure and the slop that was on that boy, and that father didn't say a blessed word other than, let's have ourselves one vocation party, I believe that God is big enough, don't you? And I believe that God is merciful enough, don't you? And I believe that God is gracious enough, don't you? You talk about generous, you talk about extravagant love, grace, and mercy. That, at, that identifies our Heavenly Father in ways and in terms that we need to figure out. Because what keeps us from being in relationship is grief and guilt and shame. What keeps us from coming all the way home as we need to is guilt and grief and shame. But the father saw the boy. Don't you think he knew who he was? He knew who he was. He knew where he'd been. He knew why he was coming home. He knew how stinky he was and how filthy he was. And none of that stopped him from running. Let me back it up. The, the daddy had been looking for the son. The son ain't been looking for the daddy. The daddy had been looking for the son. The daddy, wherever it was that he was, and I don't know where he was, but that daddy had been looking down the road, and it says he saw him a far way off. How did he know him? I don't know, except as a daddy. I got four kids, and I can pick them out of the crowd because every one of them walked differently. I got a friend that lived down the road, Greg Blum. 
I've known Greg Plummer for the last 32, 35 years since I was a pastor. And if I see Greg Plummer walking in a crowd of people, I can pick him out of everybody in that crowd because I know how he walked. Can you hear me? And my guess is that God knows how you walk. And God knows how you look. And God can identify you even in a crowd. Can't be. And so the daddy is looking and the daddy sees him. And the daddy doesn't wait. Do you hear what I'm saying? The daddy initiated this act of grace. The daddy initiated this act of mercy. The daddy initiated everything. Not the boy. The boy's not in a frame of mind to receive. The boy's not in a frame of mind. The boy just has sense enough to realize my daddy loves me enough I can come all the way home. At least I hope I can. And the daddy sees him a far distance off and he runs. I saw my daddy running. Let me tell you something. You don't hear anything else here than this. If I were to bring the prodigal back right now and ask him, tell me your story. Here's what he'd say. I saw my daddy running. I saw my daddy run three times in my life. I saw my daddy run to save my eye. I saw my daddy run to save my life. And I saw my daddy run because he needed to. <laughs> Amen. <coughs> don't you think God, don't you think God is, is, is as good as my daddy or your daddy? Don't you think your daddy knows what you need? Don't you think your daddy knows where you've been? Don't you think your daddy knows how badly you screwed this thing up? Don't you think your daddy cares? Do you really think your daddy cares about where you've been and how, how messy you are? No. All daddy knows is, <coughs> my boy's home. Let me go get it. And all the son or daughter can say is, I saw my boy. And my daddy wasn't running away. My daddy's running too. Did you hear that? My daddy's running too. I don't know about you. I don't know where you are or where you've been, but I do know this. I know that no matter where you've been and but no matter where you have been, and no matter what you have done, and no matter what is encrusting your body or your soul or your heart, all that you need to know is you can come home. And all you need to know is God is big enough, loving enough, gracious enough, and merciful enough take you just like you are and you be better than you are. Amen. Yes, amen. As we stand this thing and work in the